Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Pressurization and its Influence on Healthy Indoor Air Quality, which is going to be presented by Eddie Kelly. We really appreciate you joining us today, and my name is Ron Pilkowitz. So I'll be moderating today's call. Because you may want to watch this webinar again or refer it to others, it will be recorded and posted on Belimo's YouTube site. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and Eddie would like to answer as many questions as he has time for. So I invite you to type your questions into the question box, and I will read them aloud during the question and answer session. If for some reason we do not get to your question, please rest assured that Eddie will answer you via email. Thank you again, and I would now like to turn the presentation over to Eddie. Awesome. Thanks, Ron. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good day, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Eddie Kelly. I'm a product manager for Belimo here in the Americas on the sensors and meters side. Um, and again, thanks for joining as we discuss uh, pressurization and its influence on healthy indoor air quality. Um, so I don't want to keep you guys too long here today. Let's jump right into this. Um, Quickly, just to kind of give you guys an agenda or an idea of what we're going to be dis discussing here today. Firstly, we're going to talk about um, really what makes up indoor air quality. I, I know over the past year and a half, kind of, you know, all of our worlds have been, you know, turned upside down. There's been a, a lot of focus on, you know, indoor air quality and, and, and what composes it. So I really just want to scratch the surface here and then, you know, relate that to pressurization and how we can use pressurization to really control our, our IAQ levels. Um, from there, we'll jump into, you know, what exactly is pressure? Again, we'll kind of keep this more generic. You can kind of, we could really go down the rabbit hole here. Um, and then I'll relate that to, you know, HVAC and, and building automation systems in general. Um, and then we'll jump into the importance behind pressure control and, and really why is it important to use, you know, pressure sensors and, and control and monitor pressures within our applications and zones. Um, from there, I go on to uh, give, give some specific application examples, um, some applications that have, you know, that use a net positive pressure or also a net negative pressure. Um, and then we'll go into so, some of the control principles behind it um, with a couple of examples as well as um, a, a, a simple, more generic pressurization control loop to kind of help us kind of conceptualize how we can use pressure sensors, you know, within our facilities to, to again, control our indoor air quality levels and, and really mitigate the risk of, of any health issues or, or contamination through, through our envelopes and, and so on. Um, and then finally, we'll be finishing up with, of course, the importance in, uh, behind accuracy and calibration and, and really, depending on the application, how often these guys are, are calibrated. Um, and then, as Ron said, we'll also be finishing up with a, a question and answer session. Um, that being said, if we run out of time and I don't have time to get to all of your questions, um, rest assured we will have a printout and all of the questions will be sent to me and I'll be able to answer you guys after the call one by one. All right, so let's jump into this here. Again, I just kind of want to scratch the surface of indoor air quality. I know that, you know, over the past year and a half, we've seen hundreds of, of webinars um, on what indoor air quality is and, and the importance behind it. Um, so generally speaking, you know, when we're talking about indoor air quality, we really like to, you know, talk about six kind of main metrics. Um, so of course, you know, we, we, we want to maintain and, and monitor temperature, um, CO2 levels, of course, as we breathe in and exhale, you know, we exhale CO2. Um, humidity and moisture content within our spaces. Of course, uh, particle size is also really important, as you can imagine, you know, that the smaller the particle sizes are in the air we breathe, um, you know, the more our body can readily absorb those. So that could become quite dangerous, especially when we're talking about airborne pathogens and things of this nature. Um, also, part of you know the indoor air quality metrics is of course airflow, um, bringing airflow into zones, airflow out. This also relates directly to pressure, as you can imagine, um, and also VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, so this can include odors, smells, you know, tobacco, tobacco smells, colognes, perfumes, um, also harmful gases, you know, carbon monoxide, nitro nitrogen dioxide, things of this nature. Um, but again, you know, we don't really want to focus this presentation too much on indoor air quality. We, we've, we spent the last year and a half really explaining the importance, you know, trying to bring our facilities up to speed to make sure our inhabitants and, and occupants are, you know, happy, healthy, and safe. Um, now, as things start to really open and our buildings start to, to open for the, the, the public environment to come in, you know, let's take a step forward and look at, you know, how pressure sensors and, and, and pressurization within our facilities can again really help control and maintain these indoor air quality levels. 
So again, so just generally speaking, you know, what is pressure? Um, if you want to look at it as an equation, right? Pressure is force over area, and that's that's a given force over a cross sectional area. So if I want to show that graphically, right? We could see a, a force vector coming down perpendicular to again a given cross sectional area. Um, now this is again this is the equation. Um, it's not too relative to us in the HVAC building automation world, of course, because we're not inhabiting, you know, a flat piece of paper. We're inhabiting, inhabiting, and living in zones, rooms, and and so on. Um, so if I relate, if I relate this back to, you know, HVAC systems and and building automation in general, it really relates to air movement, either air going into a zone um, or air escaping a zone. So this specific little drawing I've got down here, of course, and, and air is moved within our facilities with, with fans and blowers. So if we're blowing air into a specific zone and that air cannot escape or, or less air is leaving the zone than, than is entering, we have a net positive, uh, a positive pressurized zone. There are specific applications, of course, that, that require positively pressurized zones. And they're also, you know, vice versa, there's applications that require negatively pressurized zones. Um, but for this specific uh, illustration here below, we've got a fan blowing air into a zone. The air cannot escape, as you can see, that it's kind of a sealed off zone. Again, it's just a picture. Um, and that ensures that our ha inhabitants, you know, whether it be medical personnel, students, ourselves, you know, office employees, et cetera, um, you know, maintaining and controlling pressure within our zones will ensure that our inhabitants are happy, healthy, and safe. All right, so now switching gears a little bit, you know, why is pressure control important? And, and as, as you can imagine here, as we look at the University of Pittsburgh, you know, football practice facility, there's a sports dome there. Um, pressure within these sports domes, and, and there's, they're all over the world, is very, very critical. Um, but that's just a typical example, one small example there. Um, I really want to relate this back to energy efficiency. So as we all know, you know, conditioned air is not cheap, it's not free, um, it's actually pretty expensive. Um, as we start to bring in air from the outside, that air outside is not conditioned. So when you bring this air in, you have to change the temperature, you have to remove moisture, um, you've got to push the air you know, through filters, you got to clean the air and so on. Um, so when this gets into our facilities, we, we need to ensure that this air does not escape Right, so if we're spending all this money on conditioning the air to bring up, you know, to, to meet these high, highly healthy, you know, indoor air quality levels. We can use pressurization to ensure that the that the air stays within certain certain zones and within our facilities. Um, so as you can imagine, again, you know, we could use pressure to keep the air inside of our envelope and inside of our buildings, so we don't have to continuously. Um, you know, pay more and more money and use more and more energy to to continuously condition new outside air. So again, you know, this leads to a direct impact on the the overall efficiency levels of our buildings and applications, um, which, as you can imagine, it, it is I'm sure checks off the box for a lot of us. Um, it, it it has a direct impact on on our overall expenditures, and of course, you know, we could really increase our our, our costs, or I'm sorry, our cost savings. Now, I mean, that being said, you know, everyone likes to save money. Um, but again, overall, by using pressure sensors and, and really focusing on the pressurization within our facilities, um, you know, again, we, we, we can increase our efficiency. So globally, a uh, little fun fact here, actually, one of the biggest um, one of the biggest energy uses globally across the world is actually building automation systems and, and HVAC in general. So as you can imagine, if, if collectively, you know, across the world, all of us really take a in-depth look at pressurization and how we can increase control within our facilities, you know, again, collectively, we really can make the world a better place uh, for ourselves immediately and, of course, for, for future generations down the road. So another reason here, uh, you know, why, why is pressure control important? Well, firstly, you know, pressure... Um, can be used to keep things and, you know, harmful contaminants, harmful things um, out. And when we're talking about, you know, hospitals, operating rooms, things of this nature, this relates directly to life safety. So as you can imagine, if we have an operating room, let's just say, as an example, maybe somebody's there on the table uh, for, for an open heart surgery. Um, that room has to be positively pressured. You want the air, that clean air in there to escape the room versus, you know, dirty uh, contaminated air coming in. 
Um, there's always going to be more or less leaks um, around door sills, window frames, um, even through the uh, through, through the ceilings. Um, there's always, usually there's a small gap underneath doors. If you have a positively pressured environment, you have the air within that environment escaping. Versus the opposite, you know, if it's a negatively pressured environment, you'll have air coming in from the outside. And in a, especially in a medical room, operating room, that's a big time no-no. Um, the last thing you want during surgery is is dirty, contaminated air coming in and potentially infecting your your patient. So here we have uh, a happy, healthy Eddie sitting post-operation in his in his chair there because he knows for sure the hospital that did his surgery. Um, without a doubt, monitored and controlled the pressure, uh, the pressurization within the, the, the operating facility there. Now, I mean, vice versa, right? So again, we're still talking about life safety, um, but uh, on, on top of a positively pressurized room, making sure that contaminants cannot come in, um, we could look at it uh, on the opposite spectrum as well. So there's certain applications and environments where you actually need the spaces to be negatively pressured. Um, and with a negatively pressured environment, Again, you're, you're sucking things in from the outside. So this could be chemicals um, type, uh, like, like a, a scientist, a scientific lab. It could be like a sick room within a hospital where you don't want contamination escaping. Um, so again, in, in these type of scenarios, you're exhausting more air than you're pushing into the room. So if a door opens or a window opens, the outside air is coming into the affected room versus, you know, of course, if you open a door to a sick bay, you don't want that, that dirty contaminated air to escape. Um, and that's that holds true for, again, you know, science, uh, scientific labs, um, chemistry type things, and, and, and so on. So various applications do require negative pressure. Um, and again, that the negative pressure applications are, are there to keep these harmful particles in. Um, so a lot of these applications, you know, the, the people that work within these environments, they have, you know, PPE, they're, they're trained to work around these harmful gases, these harmful chemicals. Um, and again, through pressurization, you can ensure that the harmful gases stay within your zones to make sure that the people or inhabitants that are, you know, not necessarily maybe next door, but that are outside of the room, um, again, remain safe. So pressure sensors can absolutely be used for life safety. Um, and again, you know, you, you can't control what you can't measure. Um, so again, pressurization is absolutely critical in, in life safety applications, medical, um, as well as like the scientific type, you know, harmful gas type applications as well. So as promised here, we've got a couple applications or a couple examples of some applications here. And, and firstly, I want to start with the positively pressurized applications. Um, so this first one, of course, and I'm going to be kind of touching on it here a couple more times, is medical rooms. It's very, very important to ensure these medical rooms and, and operating rooms are positively pressured. You do not want contaminants coming into these rooms, you know, during surgeries or if there's any open wounds or anything like that. Um, so, of course, medical rooms, hospitals, um, things like this are, are absolutely, at, you know, very, very good examples of positively pressurized applications. Another one is clean rooms. Um, so, of course, we're all familiar with, uh, you know, wearing masks over the past year, year and a half or so. Um, so clean rooms, depending on the application, um, whether it be a medical application, um, it could be engineering, it could be, uh, you know, R&D type scenarios and so on. Clean rooms also, again, you do not want dirty things or dirty particles contaminating the room itself. So by positively pressurizing these zones, again, you can ensure that any leaks in the envelope, um, there's no outside air coming into these positively pressurized zones. And then a little fun fact here, um, frogs actually have actually use a positive pressure type scenario to force air into their lungs. Um, so their lungs that kind of have like a negative pressure differential. So if you bring in air and you could force it, of course, positive pressure is going to move towards a negative envelope. That negative envelope is the, the frog's lung. So they actually use pressure to force air down versus, you know, sucking it in like we do as humans. <clears throat> All right, so now switching gears and, and talking about, you know, looking at some applications that require negative pressure. Um, again, I kind of mentioned this before, isolation and, and sick rooms, right? So this happened a lot at the beginning of our COVID pandemic where we had kind of remote pop-up sick bays. Um, there's a lot of overflows at certain hospitals when they become kind of, when the, when the hospitals hit capacity, they actually put um, you know, negatively pressurized tents and zones outside of the hospital facilities to be used as as like a COVID-19 um, overflow. So these guys were absolutely negatively pressurized um, because if you have a, a, you know, one of these tents, you know, filled with a few 
um, you know, COVID positive, for example, people, um, you, the air they're breathing in, coughing, et cetera, you know, that is contaminated air. And you want to ensure that that air stays within, you know, within the environment itself. You don't want that air to escape and potentially contaminate others. And again, you know, another one could be laboratories, you know, working with harmful gases and harmful chemicals and so on. Um, having these kind of applications negatively pressurized keeps the harmful gases within the facilities, within the environment, and it keeps you know, the inhabitants and the occupants outside of these walls um, safe, from, safe from what's within the actual application itself. So negatively pressurized applications, I mean, so you could use a negative pressure, uh, uh, negatively pressurized room to, to actually control odors. Um, so as marijuana, again, becomes, start, starts to be more and more legal and readily available, there's a lot of grow farms popping up all over the place. Um, and of course, it, it, these actually kind of get really kind of smelly. Um, so these kind of applications use pressure sensors all across their zones to control where these odors go. Um, Canada has been legal for uh, quite some time now, and it, it's, it's at the point now where there's um, these little towns up in Canada actually have, have um, zoning regulations and, and, and regulations that limit the amount of odors that can leave these facilities. Um, so by having a negatively pressurized room, the odors and the, and the air within the room itself cannot escape the room. So that's kind of how you can control um, and move around odors within these, within these facilities. All right, so switching gears a bit here, um, and now we're jumping over to, you know, controlling and measuring pressure. And again, you know, you can't control what you don't measure. Um, so everything starts with a sensor, uh, whether it be a pressure sensor, pressure switch, and so on. Um, this picture you're looking at here is a differential pressure sensor. So it's actually got uh, two, two probes that'll come out and pick up pressure in two separate locations. Um, so what this guy does is it'll, it'll of course, measure a differential pressure value, um, and then it sends a signal to a building management system or, or a building automation system or controller. Um, the, the language that this guy speaks to the controller is actually a, a few different variants. So you could have a, a signal being sent from the pressure sensor in, in a voltage variant, voltage form for zero to 10 volts. Um, of course, depending on the measuring range, it's a direct ratio. Um, and the same with current. So you could have a four to 20 milliamp output signal that goes to the BMS system as well. Um, here at Belima, we also offer uh, the Modbus communication um, variant as well for our pressure sensors. And again, these guys speak directly to the building management system, um, and the, the, the BMS system then takes that information, depending on the application and, and set points and programming, then sends a signal to a, to a control device, which is typically an actuator, um, and then based on the pressure sensor's you know, output, that actuator is either going to open or close a damper, which will allow airflow either in or, or out of the room. So again, you know, you could take the pressure sensor itself, sends a signal to the automation system. The automation system probably has certain set points associated with it. Based on those set points, a signal is sent out to an actuator which controls a damper, um, which will open and close uh, to either inhibit or prohibit, you know, air in or out of our of our zones. Um, another example here is, is pressure switches. So the guy that we looked at before, the the rectangular. Um, the rectangular sensor is a is a transmitter speaking real time its entire product life it's it's continuously speaking to the automation system what we're looking at here is a pressure switch um, it's got a manual set point on it and it, it it actually has an onboard relay and it will only send a signal to the bms system when that set point is hit um, so a lot of times these are used for controlling fans uh, I'm, I'm sorry uh, monitoring filters you could put one in front of a fan if a fan uh, if a fan you know, is faulty or, or something happens with the fan where it stops, you'll have an immediate either drop or increase in pressure. Um, so a lot of times these guys are used um, really as a, alarms. Um, specifically speaking on the filter side, if you use one of our pressure switches, you know, to monitor how dirty or how clogged a filter gets, as you can imagine, when air flows through a filter, the filter picks up the dirty particles in the air itself. So the longer that filter is installed, it's going to get dirtier and dirtier over time. Um, and as it gets more clogged, air won't be able to move freely through it. So the dirtier that filter gets, um, you know, the, the, the higher the pressure upstream will get as well. The pressure will continue to raise um, as that filter gets dirtier. Then you have a set point on the switch itself. So when it hits a certain point, you can send an, send an alarm to the BMS system, um, which will alert you know, the end user, the, the, the maintenance manager and so on to say, hey, you, know, you have a high differential pressure value at this filter, you know, maybe it's time to replace it. 
most filters also have the have the differential pressure value on the on the actual filter itself that you would set these switches to. All right. So as problems, we have a a little visual here, um, kind of talking about a generic you know application. And again, very generic here, but I kind of wanted to to introduce our the pressure switch as well as the 22 ADP. Um, differential pressure sensor and, and really how they seamlessly kind of talk with a controller and, and, and really perform kind of a pressurization control loop here. So if we look at airflow coming in from the duct itself, right? The duct is, is the rectangular region up top. Airflow is coming in from the left. You're gonna push airflow through a filter, right? Because of course the filter is gonna clean the air coming in. So as this filter gets dirtier, you will have a buildup of pressure on the upstream side and you have a differential pressure switch here again that will alert the system when that filter becomes clogged to a certain level um, and then you'd want to tell your system hey it, it, it's time to, to change the filter out as the air continues to move through uh, through the filter here it goes through this damper and it comes into the zone itself so as the air comes into the zone again the, the amount of air being pushed into the zone denotes the pressure level in the zone itself so the more air that goes in um, you know your higher your pressure will be and, and vice versa so as air comes into the zone itself, we have a little um, a room pressure pickup place. It's basically a little stainless steel, um, you know, wall-mounted uh, accessory that we could route our our 22 ADP. We could route our transmitter to the back of it. So you actually send a, a, a tube from our transmitter to the back of this steel plate, um, and then that allows our sensor to me measure and monitor the exact pressure within the zone itself. Um, we then take that signal, of course, right? So that the, the sensor is measuring the pressure, converting it into a signal, you know, whether it be cur a current signal, voltage, uh, or Modbus, and it sends that signal to the DDC controller. Based on set points, based on the application and programming, that controller then decides to send a signal to an actuator, um, which is this other rectangle up top here, and it'll tell that actuator again to either open or close the damper to either allow more air in or to stop the airflow going in based on the pressure levels that, that the, the sensor is reading. Um, and then the, the cycle pretty much starts, starts all over again. So it is a, it is a repeated cycle. Um, and again, this is just a very generic kind of application example that I, I hope you guys can kind of turn around and, and, and really focus in on your applications with. All right. <clears throat> So again, so, so as we're kind of nearing the end here, I really wanted to touch on accuracy and, and the importance behind accuracy and calibration. Um, so as we know, I mentioned a few times here, pressure sensors and pressurization has a direct impact on life safety, especially when we're talking about hospitals, operating rooms, things of this nature. So that being said, you know, accuracy is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, a lot of these sensors, especially on the lower pressure ranges, um, they're bi-directional, so they can go either negative or positive. So you definitely don't want to be in a situation where your sensor has been installed for you know quite some time, um, it's drifted over the years, has never been calibrated, and then you know you, you don't want your sensor <laughs> sending a, a negative pressure signal when you're actually in a positive environment. So accuracy calibration is very important. Um, and on the calibration side, so on typically for non you know non critical applications, we 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 hear that um, you know depending on the application, of course, the guy, these guys get zeroed out and calibrated typically once a year. Um, on the critical side, hospitals, again, you know, harmful gases, things like this, these guys are calibrated and zeroed out typically two to three times, maybe sometimes even four times a year. Um, so if we kind of circle back to what Belimo offers here, we actually, with our pressure sensors, offer what we call a true auto zero. Um, it's an added feature, not all of our sensors have this, um, but this is a feature that, that basically takes our, our pressure transmitters and it zero, auto zeros and calibrates itself out every 10 minutes throughout its, throughout its product lifetime. Um, so this is a feature that, you know, it's, it really is a set and forget feature and it's, it's aimed to, um, again, you know, to, to mitigate this, this accuracy drift that's known in the field um, and continuously push out, you know, and, and promote a fully accurate pressure value. Um, so I think that's about it. We got 25 minutes in. Looks like we got five minutes left for questions. So I'll kick this over to Ron. Um, thank you guys very much for bearing with me up to now. Ron. Excellent. We... Thank you very much, Eddie. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Before we do get to questions, uh, please be sure to follow Bulima on social media to keep informed about what's happening with our company. Okay. First question we have, how often does the Bulimo auto zero function zero the sensor out? 
Ooh, that's an easy one there. Um, so, so the auto zero function zeroes it out every 10 minutes. Um, and again, that's uh, that, that's not available on all of our pressure sensors. Um, it's only available on on a few select pressure sensors. So if it's not needed, you don't it, you, you don't need to need to have that. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Yep. Next question: Are the Belimo pressure switches manual or auto reset? That is a good question. The Belimo pressure switches, um, the the ones that we were specifying before with filter monitoring, those are auto reset. So as soon as the pressure um, comes back down and in, in, you know, back into its its uh, open window there, um, that relay will then disconnect and it'll it'll automatically reset itself. Okay, we have time for one more question. Can you use a differential pressure sensor to measure static building pressure? Um, yes. So our differential pressure sensors again have have two pickup points um, to measure static pressure. You would only route the positive the positive pickup point into whatever zone you want to measure, um, and you'll actually leave the negative port completely open, and that 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 would absolutely measure static static building pressure. Okay. Thank you very much. There's a couple of questions that have come in, but they look a lot more detailed, so I'm going to let you answer those via email, Eddie. I want to great. thank you again for presenting today and thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Please remember, if you have any questions after this call today, you feel free to email training at us.belimo.com, and we will get your answers to, to Eddie for uh, answers. And thank you so much again for attending today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you Fantastic. so much. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.